to you. Turn with me to Romans chapter 11, if you would please. Romans chapter 11. And we're going all the way to the end tonight. Romans chapter 11, verse number 33. This is what Paul says. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Now he's going to ask two questions following that statement. And one's going to have to do with the wisdom and knowledge of God. And the other's going to have to do with the riches of God. And he's going to ask the questions in the reverse order of the way he introduced the concepts in the verse before. In verse 34, he says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. God, we come to you once again. Lord, I ask for your help in communicating your word tonight. I pray that we would listen with attentive ears. And I pray that you'd have liberty to speak to us tonight, to hear from you. God, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done. And Lord, may uh, this testimony of praise tonight that we just read in your word, may it... Uh, be contagious tonight. May it cause us to want to praise you from our heart as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Some have called this four-verse passage right here a doxology. A doxology is basically just like a, like a closing uh, sentiment or prayer or praise that's given to God. And that's certainly what the Apostle Paul is doing but you need to understand where this praise comes from. It just does, th this praise doesn't just spontaneously combust. It doesn't just arise out of nowhere. As a matter of fact, the praise that, that the Apostle Paul records for us in verses 33 through 36 are the culmination of 11 chapters of writing. If you could just imagine with me that Paul sits down at a table and it's on his heart by the Spirit of God to write a letter to the church at Rome and he starts writing and the Spirit of God is bearing him. Uh, he is being born of God through the, the miracle of inspiration by God to write the words that he's writing. And what he's actually writing is a doctrinal treatise about God's salvation and, and how God worked in order to forgive man and justify sinners and bring peace to the heart of sinful man in relationship with him. And so as Paul writes, he goes from one point to another point to another point to another point that builds to the point of him exclaiming, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, exclamation point. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out, exclamation point. The next two questions are rhetorical questions. They're not things that he's trying to figure out. The answers are already implied and the questions are asked to stir our minds to think about how great and good and big our God really is. I got to tell you tonight to open your Bible and read these four verses without understanding the context that came before them would be like walking into an auditorium where Handel's Messiah is being performed and hearing the last Alleluia and going, well, I know they're praising, but what about? <laughs> Not realizing that there was a whole composition before that that told exactly why that hallelujah is being exclaimed, why God is being lifted up. I, I, I'm just, I'm telling you tonight, there's a reason why Paul is so amped 
if I could use that word, why he's so stirred to praise here. And it's because of what the Spirit of God through him has had him to write in the chapters before. In chapter 1, he wrote that he's not ashamed of the gospel, but went ahead to describe how godless humanity is trying to get further and further away from God. In chapter 2, he writes about how the religious Jews are not any better, nor are they helping the situation because they don't have any more desire for God than the godless Gentiles do. They're going about trying to establish their own righteousness, and they're trying to establish a relationship with an almighty God on their own terms. And he concludes in chapter 3 that all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God, that there's none righteous, no, not one. But he didn't leave them in despair in chapter 3. In chapter 4, he points them back to the example of Abraham. And he says, listen, you need to understand that Abraham had a relationship with God, a personal relationship with God. And what was it that enabled Abraham to be in relationship with God? He answers that question, it was his faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's the absolute truth. That by Abraham believing God, God counted his faith for righteousness. And he went ahead to instruct that all who come to Christ by faith God counts their faith for righteousness. He forgives them of their sin and he justifies them. That's why Romans chapter 5 starts the way it does. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful, wonderful statement that is. In chapter 5, he goes ahead and, and gives doctrinal foundation for the belief that even though all children of Adam are sinners, that in Christ all can be made righteous. That there's a progenitors of two different races there. Adam is the progenitor of the race of the dead, but Christ came to be the progenitor of the race of the living. And he would describe that uh, as being uh, that by one man's offense, uh, many had to face death, but by one man's obedience, many are made righteous. And he talks about uh, the importance of faith in Christ. And in verse number uh, 21, he says, That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that a person is justified by faith in Christ and has peace with God, he launches into the Christian life by saying that now that we're forgiven and now that our sins past, present, and future are covered by the grace of God, does the abundance of God's grace excuse the sin of a child of God. And he would go on to say, God forbid. We should not continue in sin that grace may abound, but we need to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin and alive unto God. In chapter 7, he talks about this battle that every Christian fights, the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And Paul even acknowledges in chapter 7 that there's things that he would do that he doesn't. And there's things that he shouldn't do that he does. And he concludes that there's still a wretched man that lives within him. But he points in chapter 7 at the end to the promise that one day that wretched man will not be around anymore. And that's the promise of glorification. Now if you're tracking this, what we have is we have sinners in the first three chapters. And then we have justification by faith in chapters 4 and chapter 5, chapters 6 and 7 talk about sanctification. That is being set apart in our Christian life to live a holy life unto God. And then at the end of chapter 7, he introduces the concept of glorification. And chapter 8 becomes all about the coming glorification of every believer. That everyone who's put their faith in Christ has already been predestined by God to glorification. That glorification is just simply this. 
the old man is completely gone and we, we become who we fully are to be in the new man created in the image of Christ Jesus. And that is yet to come. So he's talking about salvation. Salvation starts with a sinner who puts his faith in Christ and God justifies him on the basis of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then that Christian begins to fight the good fight of faith and, and to uh, try uh, seek to be holy before God in our daily lives and in our decisions and do what God would have us to be, awaiting the promise of glorification that's coming. You say, what part of that is salvation? I got news, friends. It's all salvation. It's all the plan of salvation that God gave. And then he begins in chapter 9 to answer some questions about how this salvation came about. And it came about because God chose a people called Israel. And God chose them for the purpose of bringing about a Savior in the flesh through that race of mankind. And they were God's, they were God's elect. They were God's chosen people. And what we found out in chapter 9 is that God set forth a sovereign purpose to bring salvation to the world and nothing could mess that up. The, the nation of Israel couldn't mess that up. The, the, out, the outside nations, the Gentile nations, they couldn't mess up God's plan. Even though both tried, they failed because nothing can deter the sovereign plans of God. In chapter 10, we begin to look at the fact that God still wants Israel to be saved. As a matter of fact, he even says in verse number 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all who call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he goes on to answer questions about why they're not saved. And the reason why they're not saved is because they've hardened their heart to the gospel. God reached out time and time again, and they just continually hardened their heart against the gospel. But God still has a plan for his people. And in chapter 11, what he's told us is that God has not cast them off, but that he is working his plan, and he's going to come back to Israel where he left off. And he's going to pick them up again. And they're going to be responsible in the end for the furtherance of his plan and for the furtherance of the gospel. And when he concludes that, as we did the last time we were in the book of Romans, all of this crescendos into this praise of saying, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You know what I love about this? Paul says, look, th there's more to salvation than we can understand. And he just wrote about it for 11 chapters. 11 chapters of doctrinal detail. Some have said that these 11 chapters of the book of Romans provide more doctrinal detail to God's plan of salvation than is found in any other single book of the Bible uh, uh, in the New Testament. And I would say that's absolutely accurate. And yet by the time he gets done, he says, look, there's a lot more that we don't understand. There's a lot more about the mind of God and the processes of God that aren't fully unlocked. And then he asks this question. He says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Here, here's what he's pointing at. There's two things that he mentions about God's role in salvation. They involved two characteristics of God. Please don't miss this tonight. This is really good stuff. Number one is his riches. And number two is his wisdom and knowledge. I don't know if you've ever stopped and taken time to meditate upon God's plan of salvation. Meditation, by the way, is a biblical word and it's, it's a good pastime. I, it'll help you with your blood pressure. And I'm not talking about transcendental meditation like in Eastern religions. I'm talking about thinking prayerfully about 
God and his word and what he says. Asking God to help you to understand his word. You ever done that with the plan of salvation? I'm telling you, there's more to God's plan of salvation than you and I can fathom. You know, I, um, this month, I will have been saved for 40 years, coming up on my 40th spiritual birthday. And, and I, have, I, I haven't meditated on God's word near as much as I should have. But I'm telling you, I've loved God's word and I, I love being in God's word and I love thinking about God's word and I love studying God's word. And I'm telling you, 40 years after I came to know Jesus as my savior, I'm still finding intricacies to the plan of God that I thought, I never knew that was part of it. I never knew he did that. I never knew that's what he meant. Almost every week I'm learning new things about the plan and purposes of God as I spend time in his word and as I study his word and seek to rightly divide his word. And look, it's, it's going to take seeing him face to face before I know it completely. But man, the search is worth the effort. It's good. It's good. You know... Uh, more and more all the time, I'm finding out just how rich God really is. You know, uh, you can have Elon Musk. <laughs> I know he's got a lot of money. That's fine. But God's richer than Elon Musk. God's richer than anybody that you might want to put in the blank who you think is wealthy. Their wealth is a pauper's wealth compared to the wealth of God. God is, God is so wealthy. As a matter of fact, I encourage you sometime, go back and read through the book of Romans again and just look for the word riches. You can use a concordance if you want to cheat. But using a concordance, you're going to miss out on some context. But I'm telling you, Paul talks about the riches of God again and again and again. And it's not just in his book of Romans, but in Ephesians, he talks about, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. I'm thankful that I've got a God who's rich in mercy. I'm thankful I've got a God who's rich in love. I'm thankful that I've got a God who's rich in grace. I'm thankful I've got a God who's so rich that here, here he, here's what he does. His wisdom and knowledge fashions a plan of salvation. But notice this. God's plan was going to cost more than all of humanity combined could ever pay. I'm happy to tell you tonight, the salvation to you is free. But that doesn't mean salvation didn't have a cost. Salvation cost more love than you and I can know in this life. It costs abounding grace and endless mercy that's new every morning. God devised a plan, but I'm thankful God was wealthy enough to put it into action. He had enough riches and he had enough wealth to bring it about. And here's the thing, listen very carefully to this, because this is what the next two verses are all about. He didn't need your help for any of it. Did you hear me tonight? I said God's wisdom and knowledge set forth a plan to redeem lost souls back to him. And he didn't need your help to come up with that plan. He didn't need your counsel. He didn't need your advice. He didn't need you saying, God, I, I think this would be a good idea. <laughs> the ideas of man are foolishness to God. The thoughts of man our foolishness to God. Go, go read 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The wisdom of man is foolishness to God. But you know what? The wisdom of God is foolishness to the world because the natural man cannot receive the things of God. It was only after I was born again did the wonders and amazement of God's plan of salvation truly open up to my mind. 
And as I've searched the pages of God's word uh, time and time again, I just stop and almost like the Apostle Paul, I just have to say, oh, the depth of his riches. Oh, the depth of his wisdom and knowledge. I, there's, so many, there's so many details about God's plan of salvation where I, when I understood it, my thought was, I'd have never even thought of that. First time I ever actually understood why Jesus was virgin born, I remember thinking to myself, I'd have never thought of that. I would have never thought that the sin nature passes down through the man because of Adam's responsibility. And had Jesus been born of the union of a man and a woman, he would have possessed the same sin nature that you and I have and sin nature, sinful choices. He would have been a sinner like you and me. And if he died on that cross, he would have died for his sin, not mine and not yours. Everybody with me on this? When I realized why he had to be virgin born, I thought, I'd have never thought of that. But God thought about that. Oh, the depth of the wisdom and knowledge of God that went into salvation. Look, once again, these verses are often quoted as well as their Isaiah 55 counterparts by the Calvinists to say, look, you... You and I can't understand God's thinking. We can't understand his mind. We, we don't make any contribution to salvation and therefore we can't even believe if God doesn't give us the faith to do so. Let me tell you something. God can still be the provider, the planner, and the executor of all of my salvation and still require of me that by faith, I accept the free gift that he's offering. Faith is not a work. Faith is not a gift. Faith is just merely this. It's the response of a poor lost sinner when his heart is convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit of God. And he says, God, I agree. I have sinned, but I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin and paid the price and when somebody believes, they are made by God his child. You know what? I wouldn't have thought to make every believer a joint heir with Jesus Christ. But the wisdom and knowledge of God thought about that. And all that that entails. You say, tell me, preacher, what all, what all does that entail? I don't even know. Because the half hasn't yet been told. Because eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered in to the heart of men the things that God has prepared for them that love him. God's revealed them by his spirit. But let me tell you something. We haven't comprehended all of what God has done for us because God's thought of things that we could never think about. So unless you're thinking that you helped God along in this, you didn't. It was all God's idea came up with the whole thing all by himself. You say, well, I contributed something to it and therefore God owes me. I'm glad you laughed because it sounds that ridiculous, right? If I preached something like that, I would hope you'd think you'd gone to a comedy show and not church because that's so ridiculous it might as well be comedy that you and I contributed something and now we, we, we are... Uh, we, we are someone who God owes a debt. Let me tell you something. God doesn't owe me anything. God, doesn't, God didn't need my contribution to bring about my salvation. God, God was wealthy enough to pay for it all by himself. Do you realize that a, that a big problem with the Roman Catholic religion and the Roman Catholic gospel is you have people that are still trying to pay for their salvation. They're trying to pay for it with their good works. They're trying to pay for it with their faithfulness. They're trying to pay for it 
with their penance. They're trying to pay for it with their Hail Marys and their rosaries and their confessions. And, and they're just still trying to atone for their own sins. I got news for you. God doesn't need our contributions to bring about our salvation. I'm glad tonight we can sing, Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. And you know what? I don't owe him anything. And here's why, because God doesn't ask for me to pay anything. He says it's a free gift. It's the gift of eternal life. He, he says that he gives, he gives it to us freely. Freely it was given to us. Freely receive. God's, God's word is, 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 is given to us at his own expense. And we haven't given some contribution that now all of a sudden God's needing to recompense unto us again. That's not the way it works. God is so big and he's so wise and he's so knowledgeable and he's so rich that, that, uh, that Paul could just ask these rhetorical, rhetorical questions. Who's known his mind? Who's been his counselor? Who's first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? And then he tells us what it's all about in verse number 36. For the person in Paul's audience who would ask the question, where do we come from? Well, Paul would say, you came from him. Well, if we come from him, then how did we get here? And how do we continue? And Paul said, well, that'd be through him. Well, but what's it all about and where are we going? Paul would say, well, we're going to him. As a matter of fact, what Paul does here in the Greek language that he's writing in, he uses three prepositions. These three prepositions mean from, the first one. The second one means uh, through. And the third one means uh, toward or unto or for. So Paul's just summing up all of creation. And what he says about all of creation is this, that it's all from him. Look, I know this is basic stuff, but it's, God's worthy of praise for this, that he's the creator of all things. God should be praised because he's the creator of all things. If you want to see this statement, these three prepositional phrases expanded then I challenge you, go read the book of Colossians. Because the book of Colossians is almost like God, to, uh, like, like uh, the Apostle Paul, God through the Apostle Paul. It's almost like the Apostle Paul took this little statement at the end of Romans 11 and just expanded it into a book of the Bible. And the book of Colossians is amazing because it talks about where we came from and how we continue and where all of this is headed. And Paul says, we are of him, which means that we are from him. We, we came from him. You, you say, wait a minute, God made Adam and Eve, but understand, God made the whole world in Adam and Eve. And God made Adam and Eve through the act of creation, but you and I came from God through Adam and Eve by procreation. And that was created by God too. So we're of God. People that don't believe in God still came from him. And it's an undeniable fact. Well, how are we here? Through him. Why don't you turn to Colossians with me for just a moment. We won't be long here. But just a few, should be a few pages over in your Bible. Uh, Philippians, Colossians. He says in verse number 16 of Colossians chapter 1, 
For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. You know what that word consist means? It means are held together and move on. The only reason that I'm here preaching to you right now is because God is upholding me by his own power. The only reason you're still breathing air and your heart's beating is because God is upholding you. God has given you consistency. Don't you understand? God's worthy of being praised for that. Somebody said to me yesterday when I asked them how they were doing, they said, you know what? No matter how I feel, I get up in the morning and I thank God for the day. I thank God for allowing me to wake up again. And I surrender myself to whatever he has for me throughout the day. Man, what a great outlook. God is worthy of praise for just holding us together today. If, if God took his hand off, well, let me just say it wouldn't be good. Because we wouldn't have any consistency anymore. God's, God's holding us together. God's holding us together. We exist through him. And everything is to him. Every, everything is to be to him or unto him. You say, where is this headed? Well, look at what Paul says. This is where it's headed. To whom be glory forever. I'm going to ask you tonight, sometimes we do this in invitation. I'm doing it right here at the end of the message. Raise your hand if you know Jesus as your Savior. Amen. Hands all over the place. You think you can put them down. You've called upon Jesus and asked him to be your Savior. Tremendous thing. How much do you stop and give God the glory for that? To give him the glory for your salvation to give him the glory for the good things that he's done in your life. Give him the glory and the thanksgiving for the, listen, the trials he's allowed you to go through. The Bible says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God deserves the glory for it all. I mean, at this point, Paul's at such a fever pitch, he amens himself. Let me tell you as a preacher, I've done it a few times. Just get so worked up and so excited about what I'm preaching, I just amen myself. He just amens himself. He says, so be it. That's what amen means. It means this is true. So be it. Amen, Paul says. He deserves the glory for it all. You say, wait a minute, this world's a mess. It's a mess, but God knows how to clean it up. And when he does, he's going to get the glory for it. Well, sinners are running rampant, but God knows how to save sinners. And he wants to save sinners, and he deserves the glory for it. You know what? There will come a day where some will die in their sins Stand before God and be cast into the lake of fire. But before they do, I'll tell you what they're gonna, what's going to happen. Even they are going to give glory to God. Because the Bible says this in Philippians chapter 2. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Say, preacher, what about God's creation that stubbornly won't give him the glory he deserves? Well, they're going to. Well, I'm telling you, all the glory he deserves, he will get. We came from him. We exist through him. 
And the glory will get back to his holy name one way or the other. God will get glory. But God makes it very, very clear how he wants to get glory through the crowning jewel of his creation, and that's humanity. He wants to get glory by a voluntary heart saying, God, I'm a sinner and I need you. And I want to conform my life to your will so that not only one day will I stand before you and give glory to your name, but that every step of my life brings you glory along the way. May that be our testimony too. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your word. And God, a moment ago, maybe there was somebody who could not lift up their hand that they've trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, that their sin is forgiven, and that they have eternal life. Lord, I pray that you would help them to understand tonight that Jesus died to save them. Jesus died to pay the price for their sin and that he wants to forgive them. I pray that they would put their faith and trust in Jesus this very night and get that matter settled in their own heart. God, I pray that you would bless this invitation now. And God, may we as your children give you the glory you deserve. Lord, maybe there's somebody here tonight that wants to just come and at this altar tonight just say thank you again for your wonderful plan of salvation. God, help us to have open hearts tonight to however you would lead and however we should respond. I pray this in Jesus.